All right, folks, uh, welcome to, well, lecture two, week three. Um, hopefully I don't have technical difficulties in my recording this week. That was like the first time in like 12 years I've had that happen to me. So, you know, um, so there are a lot of slides and I'm not gonna use most of them. I, they're there for your guys' personal reference. It, in 45 minutes, basically what I have the time to actually cover this material for you guys, I can't do 37 slides and show you guys how to do it. So I am gonna go through the start of the slide deck because that's important. And then I'm literally gonna go into demo mode and just show you guys. So much more useful. Okay, so you guys, basically this point of this whole course is to learn how to use SQL, Structured Query Language. It's the language you guys are gonna to use to talk to MariaDB. It's a language that you use to talk to almost all databases and for 100% of the relational databases. There is a standardized group called the American National Standard Institute. They actually decided to standardize the language and basically say, it's not saying, hey, Microsoft, you will do your queries this way. MySQL, you do your queries this way. Oracle, you do your queries this way. It says, if you're gonna to adhere to the 1999 standard of SQL, you must offer these features. That's what the standardization means. Different database engines do it differently of depending on what it is that they're trying to adhere to. Uh, the good news is, is My, MySQL, MariaDB, and Postgres tend to be the most modern dialects, so it's good. It's essentially a language that's designed to allow you to manipulate the structure and the contents of a database. It is not like JavaScript. It is not like Python. You actually use it in coordination with languages like Python. So a few things you need to remember about SQL before you watch me type and it may not match the examples exactly the same. SQL keywords are not case sensitive. So whether you use uppercase select or lowercase select or mixed case select, it doesn't care. So it's very forgiving in that manner. Uh, depending on what database engine you're using, the, the name of the objects may be case sensitive. So for example, if you're using IBM DB2 or Postgres, the object names are case sensitive. If you're using MySQL or MariaDB, it's not. It's just something where wherever you end up working with whatever database backend you end up working with, you're just gonna have to figure out what it is it does. You just, you know, get over some of the, those habits. Um, the other thing is, is statements are terminated by a semicolon. So JavaScript, semicolon, same thing. Um, that's only if you wanna run more than one command, one after another. If you just wanna run a single command, you don't need the semicolon. Just putting it up there. So the SQL language is divided into four pieces. There's the DDL, which is the part of the language, and we're gonna cover that pretty much in its entirety today, involved with creating and updating the structure of the database. This the part of the language that basically builds the walls of a house. It defines the house, builds the rooms, defines the rooms, what makes up the room. That's DDL. A DML, which you're also going to get a fair chunk of it today, time permitting, is to manage the data within the tables themselves. So you add data, change the data, delete the data. So it's insert, update, and delete. And usually at this point, some people will say, well, why is it insert when I talk about using inserting data? So you have to think back about when SQL was created, 1970s. What was the most common way to manage office data in the, in the 50s and earlier? Paper, also known as filing cabinets and folders. When you took a record, also known as a sheet of paper, and you would put it in a file folder, you would insert it into the file folder. That's where insert comes from, folks. Just so you know how old this language is. Um, they use a lot of North American business terminology to make the decisions on how they 
how the language behaves. Uh, there's DCL, which is basically permissions and security. Not this course, next semester. DCL, which is to manage transactions, uh, next semester. Um, TCL is really nifty. There's only like three commands, but it's really nifty. Um, yeah. Okay, so the SQL commands that we want to worry about is the DDL and the DML part of it. So DDL is create, alter, and drop. Create to make something new. Alter to change the structure. And drop, because you know, if you decide to make and put a new window in your wall, you alter the wall. You have a form that people have to fill out and you change the structure of the form, you're altering the form. And drop, well, you're just dropping it like a hot potato. Um, uh, the DML side of it, there's select, which I will show you guys the most simple version of it today, the equivalent of hello world. Um, insert, update, and delete. Insert adds, update changes, delete, deletes. And truncate, which is delete on steroids. Uh, the other two boxes we're not going to even worry about because you'll worry about those next semester. All right, so I'm going to dive into DDL now. And I'm going to mix match the, the DML at the same time because it's just going to be easier for me to do it all. Um, I literally took that one hour break to make sure I was going to do this right. Oh, wrong window. This window. See, I made myself a script so I don't forget anything. Okay, so the very first one we want to talk about and those of you that are currently doing the lab have already experienced this one. How big is the font on that screen? It is not. Okay, that's as good as it's gonna get. Otherwise I won't be able to see anything on my screen. So create database. Create database creates a new database. Basically, it's creating a new box that you can start organizing data with. Um, when you run this in data grip, you will notice on the left side that it will actually update the structure of the registered database. So here's my sample database I just created. Other database tools may not do this. This lets you create the database. If I want to get rid of the database, it's, well, database. And the database goes away. There was a database, database goes. Now, drop database is has potential for errors. Because if I run it again, you'll notice I'm getting a red line here. Database doesn't exist. So what you can do uh, is, um, you can qualify it with if it exists. So drop database if exists, sample, and now I don't get an error message. I'm gonna take this and put it right at the end of my demo. All right, so if I create a database, I also have to tell the interpreter that I'm gonna use the database. There's a piece of rocket science, use what and go. Now, if you were doing this at the command line or a different, it may not uh, do the magic like, and you notice right here, this changed. You may not have noticed that that changed, but this did change to the one I'm currently connected to. Now, I'm currently in um, the database, and if I do show tables, I hit run, you can see there's no tables. Why? It's an empty box. There's no, there's nothing inside the box. It's just an empty box. So the first thing we're going to end up doing is we need to create some tables. And tables is what we use to organize the data. 
and the, the command to create a table is create table. And you give it a name. Open your parentheses. Make sure your parentheses is closed. I'm slapping in my so I don't forget it. You'll notice that data grip currently is complaining with a little red doohickey here. It's because my table structure isn't complete. So when you create a table, you have to tell it what makes up this table. So currently I'm adding a new field or a new column. It's going to be called department ID. It's an integer. In other words, a whole number with no decimal places. And I'm going to add the name of the department. And it's a Varkar 50. Um, now, Varkar stands for variable character. I can honestly, of course, I almost, we don't have half an hour today. So, there are some very common data types that you can use. Um, the most common ones is integer, int, varkar for variable character. It means it'll hold up to 50 characters, but only occupying the space of whatever you put into it. Uh, there's date, date time, um, floats for, you know, wants lots of decimal places, um, and a few others. But those are the big ones that most people would use. So create table. You create the table, you say create table, give it the name, and then you describe what makes up this table. Now, I'm going to create this table, but then I'm going to, I mean, I am going to get rid of it, but I'm going to create it first so you can see what happens. And I go run, and uh, literally nothing, it just says it created it. If I go into sample, it shows there's my table I just created. If I open it up, you can see my two columns. Life is good. However, normally when you create a table, you tend to want to, um, there's a bit more to it than that. So in the slides, you'll see a command called describe. Describe lets you look at what's inside the table. If you happen to be working from the command line, instead of through a nice IDE like this, you don't always know what's in that table. So describe, let's you describe the table and it shows you what's inside of it. Now, I'm gonna drop this table. Because I wanna recreate it. I'm gonna drop it. And you'll notice that here's the happy if example because we don't want to throw errors if we don't have to. So if exists just says, hey, if this table exists, drop it. If not, pretend we dropped it because, well, it wasn't there. Now I'm going to add three things to this table structure. The first one is going to go not null. Not null means the value is required. Have you guys learned about null yet? Your Python class? No. Okay, well, you're gonna learn null right now. And then they're probably gonna spend like 20 minutes on it in your Python class. So, null, actually, I'm gonna use my box, okay? When you create a variable or a field and you define it as an allowing it's null, it's like this box, okay? The box exists, it's been defined. Do we know what's in this box? The contents of the box is undefined, as also known as null. If the box is empty, but you know it's empty, it's not null, it's empty. It's an empty string. Now there's shit in the box. Therefore, there's a value in the box. This is a non-empty string. This is an empty string or an empty variable. This is a null variable. We don't know what the value is. So when we set a field as not null, it means that when we add data to this table, we must supply a value for name. It's not allowed to be undefined. Okay? 
Now, the next one I'm going to do is there's a, this is all in the slides, by the way, folks, is I'm going to define a primary key. A primary key is a way of telling the database this column, it has a value in it that uniquely identifies every row of data. So row one will have a number, row two will have a number, and this number can never be repeated. In a primary key, a number can never be repeated. You, in here, for example, you all have at least one primary key, your student number. There are no two duplicated student, student numbers. You all have a unique student number. Therefore, it's your primary key. Same idea. We need to have primary keys in the database so that we can target specific rows. If we don't have a primary key on a table, there's always the risk of inserting duplicated stuff and suddenly you have a race condition. If you don't have a primary key and you're trying to update somebody's name and two people have the same name, how are you going to update it if you don't know the unique identifier for that row? So you define it as going primary key, and you go uh, the name of the column that's the primary key. So that will uniquely identify it. That is a way to define the primary key. You can actually define a primary key up here also. If I wanted to, I could have just typed it in here. There's advantages to both. Um, this is short and easy and easy to understand. This one allows you to have multi-column, which we're, we're, you're not going to learn about till next semester. So, but that's the second syntax, the longer syntax is better. And the last thing I'm going to add is a, a modifier. It's called auto increment. Auto increment will allow you to have a column that automatically gets a value. It's going to be a number. So we've all had the experience, right? When you go to some location where you have to take a number, right? You go up, you pull a number out of the machine, it gives you a number, and nobody else gets to have that number that day because it's in your hand and it's been used. Auto increment does the same thing. Every time you add a row to the table, it will automatically assign the next number. Add another row, it gets the next number. It can never go backwards. It only goes upwards. Uh, anybody here do track and field? Oh, we're all in computers. Of course we don't. Um, if ever you've watched sports and you've watched people training, you'll see sometimes people have a lap counter where they count every time a person runs around the, the racetrack to make sure they, they get the full count of laps. This is the same thing as a lap counter. One, two, three, four. So I'm going to run my command and describe it again. And you'll see now that I have a primary key. It's auto increment. Very cool. Uh, I've already showed this, so I need this. So now I'm going to add a record to the department. So if I want to add data, so we've created a table, we've modified it. Well, did modify it, we just dropped it and recreated it. I'm going to add a row of data to this. Departments, name values, QA. All right, so if I'm going to add a new row of data to the database, and I've got a typo, of course I do. I'm going to run this first, show you guys what happens. It runs, and way down here, so it's one row affected. Now, time for hello world. And I run this. Department ID 1, QA. So I'm going to add another one. Um, accounting. Oops. And I'm going to run this one. I'm going to select star from departments. And you'll notice department ID 2 has been assigned. So. You'll notice that when I'm inserting into departments, I'm only specifying the name. I'm not just specifying the department ID. Why? It's because I've set it to be an auto increment column. It means it automatically gets its next value from the auto increment identifier, which means I can skip having that ID being added in, and it will um, automatically populate. 
it helps keep your data clean. All right, now I'm going to create a more complicated table. Create table employees. Open close, semicolon, employee ID, integer, auto increment. This is nothing you haven't, I haven't shown you yet. White space means nothing. One space, 10 spaces, 55 spaces. It's not like Python. It doesn't care. You put, it doesn't have to be indented at all. First name Varkar 25, not null. Last name Varkar 50, not null. Department ID integer. Okay, so I've got a department ID. An employee belongs to a department. Normally when you get hired somewhere, you get assigned to a department. Unless it's like a super tiny company where they don't really have departments. I have worked for that. Normally you assign a department. So this is known as a foreign key. And a foreign key is a column in one table that gets its values from another table. Um, it'll make more sense when we start learning after the break about joins and stuff. Uh, but essentially, it's a column where there's going to be a rule in it saying anything you put in this column must exist somewhere else. And you got to make sure the data type matches. So I'm going to continue here. So far, it doesn't look anything too wild. So if I go primary key, employee ID, and that has been in parentheses. And I'm going to add a new constraint. Constraint. Uh, e. Okay, I'm going to get it to clean up my code like this and do I have that right? Yes. Okay, so you'll notice I added a bunch of stuff you haven't seen yet. Actually, everything above here you've seen. You know, you've seen me create a field with a name, the data type, and it's basically constraints what its rules are. What is new is this down here. This line says constraint. You give it a name. By the way, the name is optional. I just like giving my foreign keys names so that I can get rid of them later easier. And then the constraint is a foreign key. It's saying department. You'll notice when I click on it, it's highlighting it in the same table. Um, it's basically it's saying the department ID in this table will get its value from departments, the department ID up here. So essentially, when I go to insert, I'll show you, I'll just show you guys, it's easier if I show you than, I, than if I keep talking. So I'm gonna hit the run. The only thing you'll notice that's a little out of it is this new thing down here, the engine. This is a MariaDB and MySQL special. Every other database engine doesn't force you to do this. In MariaDB, if you don't tell it to use a specific kind of table, it won't enforce refer referential integrity. So this nice foreign key that I'm creating, it'll just say, that's nice, bro, moving on. It ignores the rule. If you don't tell it, hey, use something called NODB, which believe it or not stands for Innovative Database. And uh, that's something they added to MySQL uh, 12 years ago, 14 years ago, and we still have to specify it today. By telling it that means you're going to enforce a bunch of different rules. All right, so now I'm going to go run on this, and I got an error. Isn't correctly formed. 
I know this is right. Naming it. Try that again. Nope. Ready for that yet? Yeah, I am on the sample schema. And that worked. Okay. Brain fart. All the tables have to be in ODB. When I first created departments, I forgot to include engine equals in ODB. And it was not my statement down here that was wrong. It was my table up here that was wrong. By the way, I will be posting this to the announcements. So. All right, so I created this table. So I'm going to describe it for you guys so you can see it. This time I did not have a complete melt, brain melt. So here's my employee ID, first name, last name, the department. Uh, you'll notice that it has this MUL, which I don't know what that sounds for. Mandatory something or other. Okay, so these are my tables. I am going to, I suddenly realized I forgot to include the email address. So we can alter a table. And you can change the structure of the table by doing an alter table command. So alter table lets you change the structure of the table. So I'm gonna run this and describe it again, just so you can see. So you can see right now we have employee ID, first name, last name, department ID. I'm gonna hit run. And now email's been added in. Now there's a few, there's another command we can use if we want to know more, which is show table status. And this will show you, you know, the table name, what engine it's using, um, what collation it's using. A collation determines how it sorts the data. Um, Latin one has very limited character sets. For example, you can't, put in Chinese or Japanese in it, it'll just be not happy with you. So if you want to have foreign languages that go outside the normal Latin and alphabet, you have to change the collation type to like UTF-8 or to whatever applies. Um, there's a bunch of things. Um, you can even add comments if you want. Okay. Add some records to my employee. So insert into employees. And I'm not going to put in the employee ID because, well, I don't need to. And there's the part, department ID. Values. Bob. And department ID one, and I'm going to run. I'm going to go select star from employees. And here's my, you know, new employee that I just added. They're in department one. They have employee ID one. You'll notice the email is null. 
because when I added the email column, I didn't specify it as being not null. So when you create columns and tables and stuff, by default, columns are set to be null. Why? Because it's safer that way. Because if you're altering table structures and then you got a bunch of code that talks to the database, if you're adding columns, you make them not null, that means all the code needs to be updated. If you're just making non-damaging changes, you can make things like this. All right, I'm going to add another one where I'm including the email address. Like this. And actually, you will notice I'm actually going to do this a little different. I'll put the email first. Actually, let's call him Frank. Just make things easy. Okay, so when you're inserting data, the order of the columns is not important as long as the data lines up. So you'll see that email maps to email, first name, last name, and the department ID. So I'm going to run this. And this one did get an email address. Magic. Now, I'm going to add an employee, and one more employee, but I'm going to make give it an invalid department. So if you recall, I have two departments. Two departments, one department. Select star from departments, run. We've only got one department right now because I nuked the table. So I'm going to try to add someone with department three. I'm going to hit run. I get an error message. Remember earlier I said the foreign key says when you create the rule of a foreign key, any values that go into that foreign key must exist in the source table. In this case, the source table is departments. And in departments, we have one row with a single department ID of one. That means we can't insert a value of three because it doesn't exist in that table yet. If I were to add two more departments, it would suddenly start working. So let me go and um, Actually, you know what? I'm just going to change. I'm going to add another department. Counting two. And paste this one here. And here. So I'm going to do these two inserts. And I'm going to go go. And those worked. Why? Because I added another one. Therefore, two now exists. If I try to do the insert with three, Three still fails because three does not exist in departments. That's just how it works. Okay. Um, to comment out a line is, in other words, disable the line, two dashes and a space. Okay. So I've added values to my tables. So let's say I want to, um, Bob is going to become, uh, What was that? BP? Okay, let me just pull all, everything from the employees first so you can see this, that what's going to happen. Okay, you can see right here, here's Bob, right? I'm going to change the employee. And you'll notice down here is going to be one row affected. If I select the employees again, Bob became BP. That's called updating a record. Um, for now, I'm keeping this simple. You can actually modify. Multiple columns at once by basically going column value, column value. So if I do this, and you know, before it's BP tables, now it's uh, some random name. Okay, so now let's say we want to get rid of a record. If we go, uh, 
ID is equal to two. And it's not ID, it's employee ID. Like this. And I go run. And I select the results. You'll notice that the grid down here doesn't update automatically. I have to tell it, hey, refresh yourself. I hit run. You can see that record two is gone, just gone. If you don't include the where, anybody want to take a guess at what that what that's going to do? Everything goes because in SQL, if you don't tell it what you want to modify, it assumes you want to change all the things. And actually, I'm not sure if uh, Data Grip's going to let me do it. It warns me. Okay, if you're doing this on the command line, it's just going to happen. And this is where, what's my time like? Good. Here's, this is where I put in my biggest warning about working with databases. Guess what there is not? There's no undo. There's no undo. Whatever command you give it, it does it. And it does it really, really fast. So, you know, I'm going to just execute this in. That took all of three milliseconds. In actual fact, if it wasn't the fact that I'm recording this lecture and my laptop's actually trying to melt down right now from the fact that it's trying to do so many things at the same time, um, it would have been even faster. Okay, and if this is running on a real server, two rows, maybe a millisecond, maybe. Okay, so now we know that we have nothing left in our employees database. I'm just gonna put this here. And we are almost done with the demo. And I'm just gonna go, with, I'm just gonna fly through the slides really quick, make sure I didn't forget anything. There's one last command there called truncate. Truncate is like delete. If um, you want to compare uh, delete to, uh, as a skateboard and truncate as a semi, a transport truck, whatever you want to call it, wherever you're. So, and go. And actually, I'm going to go to the output pane so you can see it happen. Oh, cannot truncate because it exists in another table because it's referenced elsewhere. So truncate that, 12 milliseconds. 12 milliseconds sounds like a lot. But truncate, when you delete, what it does, it goes row one, delete. Row two, delete. Row three, delete. One million rows later, row one million, delete. Whew, that was a lot of work. Truncate, on the other hand, goes, you have no data. It, it literally tells the table there's no data. And it, because there's, in the database, there's all kinds of stuff stored, like metadata says, hey, these are the rows of data that we have blah, 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 blah. It literally says, there's nothing here anymore. And by the way, you know you auto increment? Reset that to one. Because we're starting over like it never even happened. Cool beans. Really freaking dangerous. Um, different database engines will handle the truncate differently. For example, some database servers will check if there is data being referenced. If there is not, it'll allow the truncate to happen. I can also truncate. Watch if this makes a liar out of me. Oh, I'm not going to let it. So MariaDB doesn't support cascade truncates. That's actually a good thing. Um, Postgres, for example, allows you to cascade truncate. So truncate one table. 
it cascades and wipes out anything that's related to it too. Well, it's at it. It literally just scorched earth. And that's the, if exists, I hit the, so at the end, I'm going to go uh, run and the database is gone. So this is the entire demo that covers all the slides. So now I'm going to go back to the slide deck. I'm just going to make sure I'm not, I didn't miss anything. Okay, there's create, show, use, show. Okay. okay, data types. We can go over that really quick. I've got like four minutes. So you got car and var car. Car is fixed length. So you go car 10. It will occupy, always occupy 10 bytes of data. So it will always hold 10. Even if you only put in one character, it always uses up 10 spaces. This was really important way back in the day. Anybody here remember watching a movie that had tape to tape computers on a computer and the tapes are going on the wall? Really old movies? When the software knew that it was exactly 10 characters, it knew exactly how many millimeters of tape to move the tape to get to the next piece of data. That's why we had fixed length fields. Then they brought out the first hard drives. So my first job after college or during college, I should say, was at a company running a mini computer, not a microcomputer or a PC, a mini. The main unit was about twice the size of this table. They were in the middle of migrating off of it, okay? They've been using it for 20 years almost. The hard drive, they had a hard drive. It was five megabytes. The hard drive was this wide, this tall. You could feel it through the floor 25 feet away. It was on the third floor. I didn't want to be the person below it. You could actually hear it in the whole office. The problem was five megabytes is not a lot of space. So they came up with Varkar, which is it only holds the amount of characters that's actually in there, so then there's less data usage. You have integers. Integer one, you can specify other sizes. Uh, decimal, which is a, a number with decimal places, which you can define how many decimal places. I'll be, if I'm teaching you the level two course, I'll be teaching you the specifics of that stuff next semester. But essentially, you can say it's only two decimals and it'll do the rounding for you. Because you know what people really suck at? Rounding. People cannot round. I got a 75.5. Can I have a 76? No. I'm not rounding. Uh, date stores date, time stores time. Date time stores date and time. Um, there's a Boolean or a bit data type. MariaDB and MySQL don't support it. Uh, Booleans is true, false, yes, no. You have to use an integer and just store zero or one. Um, what's really cool though, and for Booleans, if you get to work with a database engine that supports proper Booleans, is Booleans in databases, and you guys, you know, a Boolean is true, false, yes, no, right? In databases, actually, they're, they're a three state. Because if you allow a null, it's yes, no, I don't know which is fantastic. So you can actually have a Boolean where you can say, I don't actually know the answer to this. It's like asking your significant other if you want to have Mexican for supper. I don't know. It's undefined. Um, there's tons of data types. So there's a link in here that'll bring you to all the data types. And this is where I also reach out. These are the generic data types that you find in almost every database engine. Every database engine has different data types. Postgres is really cool. It's got data types for networking, like IP addresses. You can search for octets of an IP address. Trick, data types. You can store a circle in the database. You store X, Y, R. X, Y, and the radius. And it knows it's a circle that occupies that space in space. Okay? In, in Postgres? Yeah, it's a database server called PostgreSQL. Don't worry about it. It's just saying there's different database servers that offer different data types. It's just cool. Okay, I did this. Um, I did most of these. Um, there's a bunch of examples. Oh, shoot, I forgot about default. What time is it? Don't have time. Okay. 
because there's something else I want to show you guys in the last two minutes I've got. Okay, when you're doing your work, you can take your console, you go save as, and you can save this wherever you want. So I'm going to save that in on my desktop. Hey, and this is going to be uh, lecture2.sql. So there's my SQL file that I, it's created. Fantastic. I'm going to close this. I am going to go here, go here to Brightspace. Because some people have already asked me, well, how do you submit a file? Because you guys haven't learned how to submit files. Um, I'm going to put myself, pretend I'm a student. Because, well, it doesn't look the same for me. To submit a file, you actually have to click on the name of the lab. And it shows you the lab again. But a little further down, you've got a, a spot to upload. So you actually have to click on the name of the lab to be able to submit the lab. Just bright space things. Um, all right, so literally that is the time I had for today. Um, I will upload the recording. I'm hoping this time it's good. There's nothing that happened too weird. My laptop is melting, but that's okay. Outside of that, folks, I will see you guys in lab.